All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. As we continue to have a global presence here at day two of the University of Central Florida's Open Ed Live event, I'd like to welcome to our session titled, Is Opt-in the Future of Inclusive Access? I'm your facilitator, Kevin Corcoran, and I'm thrilled for you all to be here today. Uh, before we dive in, uh, just a quick reminder that this session is being recorded for future reference. Please use the chat for any questions. Um, also, feel free to use the hashtag OpenEdLive for any social meeting posts. With that housekeeping piece out of the way, let me introduce a couple of my friends and colleagues here. Nicole Allen is the Director of Open Education for Spark, and she is joined by Wendy Howard, the Director of the Pegasus Innovation Lab here at the University of Central Florida. Nicole, please take it away. All right, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Thrilled to be here at Open Ed Live to engage in this conversation about is opt-in the future of inclusive access? So I will be going first and provide some background on the inclusive access model, take us through some history, where this model came from, how it works, how it's sort of playing out on, on campuses and some things that you can look out for. And then some changes that are being proposed at the federal level uh, that could change the, the future of how these programs are implemented. And then I will turn it over to Wendy Howard to talk about UCF's experiences as one of, one of the few and certainly the most prominent institutions that engages in a opt-in billing model for inclusive access. And before I dive in, I just wanna note that, you know, my, my role here, I'm speaking as a uh, longtime advocate of, of students and student perspectives. I, I started doing this work as a student advocate 15 years ago. And I am an advocate for open educational resources and believe that you know, open education is really the, the, the future of how we do course materials in higher ed. And uh, so I'm coming to this from, uh, with a perspective, but my role here isn't necessarily to convince you one way or another on inclusive access programs. It is to present sort of the other side of the story about these programs that you're not necessarily gonna hear from vendors or, or proponents of these programs. So, um, and, you know, if you wanna learn about, you know, what some of the proposed benefits are, you know, talk, <laughs> talk to a vendor um, and, you know, take this information and use it to decide, uh, educate yourself and decide for yourself um, what is right for students on your campus and, and your institution. So I'm going to start with a, a little bit of history, just rewinding um, back to the years that I was in college <laughs> when um, text, textbook prices have been rising rapidly. And I should note, you know, we've seen, seen all seen some version of this graph. And uh, for two decades prior to this graph starting, textbook prices rose about three to four times the rate of inflation every year. So we all know there's a problem with the cost of textbooks. And the problem is actually linked to the way that the textbook market works. The market is dominated by three major companies that hold about 85% of the market. It's about a $3 billion market, probably a little bit less now, that has you know, these three companies that all engage in similar practices that uh, have sort of locked in a lot of the pricing practices that drove those prices high. And it's also a unique market in the sense that students are essentially captive consumers. They are uh, required to buy whatever materials their faculty members have assigned to them. And of course it needs to work that way because of academic freedom and faculty are the people best equipped to decide what materials are, are best for their course. But it does create this dynamic where the publishing industry has the ability to increase the price of textbooks and students don't really have any option other than to pay for it. It, it creates what the CEO of Cengage once referred to as a magical price lever <laughs> that they could press anytime they wanted to generate more revenue and lo and behold, students had to pay those higher prices. So I talked a little bit about how textbook prices have been rising, but there's actually been a, 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 a contrasting dynamic that has taken place over the last decade. 
And that is that student spending on course materials has been trending down according to some measures. And there are a lot of reasons for this. You know, students are uh, able to access a lot more ways to save money on textbooks, use books, rental programs, shopping online, you know, digital versions of textbooks have been available for well over a decade. And about 80, 88% of students engage in some cost reduction method. There are also a lot of students who don't buy their textbooks and a lot of students who are assigned open educational resources. And what all of this has done is, is, is push down the amount that students are spending every year for textbooks, even as those prices are going up. And it created this dynamic in the textbook industry where they were losing money, losing money, um, and kept increasing prices and increasing prices. And then the magical le price lever got pressed so many times that it basically broke, <laughs> that it was just not possible for the publishing industry to engage in the practices that they used to engage in. And they had to figure out a new way of engaging in business. And this was around like 2016, 2017. And at the same time, there was actually a change to federal uh, uh, regulations that, that changed how institutions are able to bill students for books and supplies costs. And we'll come back to this a little bit more at the end, but a regulation that was created that essentially allowed institutions to automatically bill students for digital course content and, and other materials without first getting a student's authorization. And that opened the door for the industry to develop a new business model that's based on essentially automatically billing students for materials. And that's the model that we know now as inclusive access. So what, what is inclusive access actually? And I think I'm gonna do a little bit of background on this just to make sure we're all on the same page because these programs are called different things at different campuses. The overarching inclusive access model is a sales model for college textbooks where the cost of digital content gets added into a student's tuition and fees. Uh, it's typically started through an agreement with an institution, usually a bookstore or other retailer and publishers. The content's typically, typically delivered by the first day of class and students have a period to opt out of being charged for it under federal regulations, although notably federal regulations do not provide standards for opt-out processes. So sometimes they're sort of uneven or untransparent in how they're implemented. And that cost gets billed to the student. And then after the course ends, since it's usually digital content, students will typically lose access to it. And of course, this model contrasts pretty significantly to open educational resources. You know, a lot of the marketing language for inclusive access sounds very similar to OER in the sense that students get day one access, it's digital, it's, you know, a, a, according to marketing language, more affordable. But there's some key differences. You know, with OER, you get materials that are free and free forever. Um, students are, are much more able to get low cost print copies. There are often restrictions on inclusive access print copies and those come at an extra cost. Students can keep OER forever and OER is openly licensed. So faculty can adapt and, and localize materials if desired. Whereas with inclusive access, it's just the same old material that everybody's always been using, just build in a different way. So it doesn't generate savings or change in the same way. There are two main ways that inclusive access programs are implemented on campuses. The first is a course by course model where students in participating courses are charged the cost of whatever materials they're assigned directly unless they opt out. And the second is the uh, flat fee or what is often called equitable access model, although I recommend against the use of the term equitable access because it's actually not an equitable model. It is an equal model, but not an equitable model. And under the flat fee model, um, all students get charged a flat amount for access to all of their materials, sort of like an average cost based on the semester or credit hours, no matter what the specific cost of the materials that they're getting. And you'll sometimes hear people try to say equitable access is a different model than inclusive access, but it's really not. It's just automatic billing calculated a different way. 
And to just show an example, this is a course by course inclusive access institution where you can see the first course is not an inclusive access course in the course catalog. And then here the second course has a, um, a, a fee associated with it and, and a link for more information on how students can opt out. And then this is an example of a campus with a flat fee inclusive access program where the program's priced at $25 per credit hour that gets charged to the student. So that would typically be $75 per course. And that gets billed no matter what the cost of the materials in, in your course actually are. And just to do a quick side-by-side -side comparison, the biggest differences is that with course by course, it's, it's some courses and not all students can opt out on a course by course basis. And faculty can opt their courses into the program and of course, if a, a class is using OER, students are not gonna get, get, get billed for that. Uh, whereas under the flat fee model, a student are, is gonna have to pay that flat fee even if their course is using OER unless there's a carve out. And opt-out is typically all or nothing. So if there's one course that forces you to stay opted in because it like has online homework or something, you're sort of stuck paying that full fee for all of your courses. And these programs are generally all campus, so all faculty are forced to participate in it, whether they want their course to be part of it or not. And uh, students, yeah, will be charged in courses that use OER. And in terms of the, I guess, concerns about these models that have emerged as they've become more prolific, it's marketed as a solution to affordability, but it's at most solving a procurement problem when the underlying market problem with the high costs of course materials remains. And the claims that these programs often make about student savings and that they improve student outcomes are really not backed by a lot of strong evidence. And, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a second. And the fact that most of these programs are implemented on an opt out model really disincentivize competition because it sort of guarantees those sales because it's so hard for students to opt out and it makes it hard. It adds that extra barrier for students to be able to shop around for the more affordable alternatives that have been um, responsible for forcing publishers to lower their prices. So it's eliminating the competition. <clears throat> So just to give you a quick example, I, this is a screenshot of, of Cengage's website, one of the major publishers. They make a claim here that, you know, this one institution saves students 75% on textbooks through an inclusive access model. But when you look at the fine print about that, it's actually that it's 71% off of print list prices. And we know the vast majority of students are engaging in cost reduction methods and actually not paying those print list prices. So this is really an, an exaggerated claim about how much money students have saved through those programs. In fact, the CEO of Cengage actually just said in an investor call <laughs> where um, playing up how much student savings is perhaps not advantageous. Um, he was quoted saying that students are, uh, the actual discounts are only 10 to 15 to 20% off of what you know, they, they might pay otherwise. And this is borne out in, in the contract language that, that, that you can find. This is a, a, some screenshots from a, a contract between Pearson, another, uh, another publisher and an institution. And you can see here that the discount is, is actually 20% you know, off of the then current online purchase price, but that Pearson reserves the right to annually adjust the inclusive access prices. So these are actually much smaller discounts than are advertised and they are tied to the current prices, which we know have historically gone in only one direction, which is up. Now, from a student perspective, I, this quote is actually from a Florida virtual campus survey and, and, and I think really sums up what I hear from, from students about these programs. I've talked to thousands of students at institutions across the country about these programs and, um, you know, I could almost always find them cheaper myself and I was not pleased that they were trying to charge me without really trying to inform me and it took way too many steps to opt out. It's a very sort of common experience for students and it, it is borne out in data in the same survey. 
uh, most of the students who who had participated in an inclusive access program did not believe that it reduced costs for them. And this is excluding the students who had opted out of the program already. And I think the savings numbers really become a lot more stark um, or, or the 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 claims that are being made about these programs become a, a lot more stark when we look at the flat fee or, or so-called equitable access model, because you are able to know exactly what students are being asked to spend on average. And this is a screenshot for the, from the Barnes and Noble website where they have a cost calculator that tells you if, if, if you switch to their flat fee model, which is called first day complete, um, it gives you an estimate of, of how much your students will allegedly save. And what they're saying here is that they want to charge $24 per credit hour, which is $720 per year. And they're saying that students spend, you know, almost twice that on average for course materials. But if you actually look at the fine print of this, and I know my little uh, sticker is blocking this, but that number is actually calculated on the basis of the average cost of books and supplies overall for students according to iPads, which is not an equivalent fact. Uh, the books and supplies budgets according to iPads include all sorts of things that are not included in the first day complete program, like supplies, you know, laptop rentals, you may need to access digital materials, non-required materials, um, you know, consumables and things like that. So uh, a, a lot of efforts to, um, uh, I guess, obscure the, the true impact of these programs on students. And, you know, the $720 a year, that is a lot for students. That is a lot of money for many students. And that's every single student is paying that under this model. And if you look at some of the numbers out there, the National Association of College Store, for example, estimates um, or claims that, that during the 21-22 school year, students spent $339 on average. And that is that means that the equitable access program is seeking to charge students almost double that. So we really need to look very closely at the fine print of, of these programs and, and really understand the, the impact on students, especially those students that are under the most financial pressure and really count on being able to seek out those savings and, and what barriers an opt-out centric model creates to those students who need savings going out and seeking them. Just a couple of final points on this. I, I do want to point out that I hear a lot of arguments about how some campuses have found that inclusive access programs have resulted in better outcomes for certain groups of students. And you know, this this is higher ed. You can find a case study to support just about any conclusion. But the only large scale multi-campus, multi-course study that that I'm certainly aware of that's been published in a uh, peer-reviewed journal is this study and it was a statewide study in Tennessee and it found that uh, actually an inclusive access pilot when you looked uh, across campuses did not have uh, a impact on academic outcomes. Uh, you know, it didn't do any harm, but like if these programs aren't reliably saving students money and aren't reliably improving outcomes, what exactly are they for? <laughs> and I think a final point I wanna make that is, um, important to keep in mind is that when we're talking about digital materials, we need to be talking about the fact that these are enhanced technology that is gathering all sorts of data on students. And by implementing an opt out model where students are essentially, it's a foregone conclusion that they have to accept the terms of service to access the material that they've been automatically built for that can be really problematic. The Chronicle did a great series that looked in depth at what some of this courseware is, is doing and, and how some of the processes are very opaque and unaccountable. And, and I encourage you to check that out. All right, so I wanna wrap up by just um, addressing what's going on right now with the Biden administration where as part of the negotiated rulemaking process that's ongoing right now about federal financial aid regulations, the Biden administration is actually proposing a change to the federal regulation that, that sort of opened the door to these automatic billing programs. 
where they're proposing to change the model so that students are opting in to billing instead of opting out. And just to quickly address this, what the current regulations say is that institutions can automatically bill students for books and supplies without getting authorization to use their federal financial aid if they have a third party agreement to make the materials at below competitive market rates, provide access within seven days of the course and have an opt out policy. And most, there, there are a couple of other ways you can do this, but most inclusive access programs are implemented under this provision. And it does explain why some inclusive access programs are implemented the way that they are. What the department is currently proposing as of the session three issue paper issued yesterday is that institutions can bill students for books and supplies only with authorization to use their federal financial aid for, to, to pay for those charges. In other words, allowing students to opt in. If the institution discloses those costs before the student gives their authorization and the student or parent chooses to purchase the materials from the institution, so that's a pretty strong opt-in. And then institutions also need to offer materials at below competitive market rates. So what this means is that if this were to go forward, inclusive access programs would need to shift to some version of an opt-in model for inclusive access if they have those programs that would give students more flexibility to be able to shop around and save money. And you know, from our perspective, the only thing an inclusive access program has to fear from an opt-in model is that they're actually not offering the value that they, they claim they offer. Like if the savings are there, if the benefits are there, students are gonna opt into that. Students are you know, smart consumers and are very, um, you know, statistics show do uh, a lot to shop around for the lowest prices. So, you know, if you're truly delivering value for students, you will see students continue to opt in. I think it's also important to note is that this change would not affect uh, separate provisions that require institutions to provide a way for, for students to use their financial aid to purchase books and supplies voluntarily. So this only affects automatic billing. And I think it's also really import, important to caveat that there is still a very long rulemaking process ahead, regardless of what the outcome is at the negotiated rulemaking hearings next week. The earliest new rules would start is July 1st, 2025, and that would require there to be you know, a, a public comment period and proposed rule, and then a final rule published before November 1st, or else it would be even farther in the future. So <laughs> we will see what happens with that. But I do want to leave you with just a couple of recommendations based on, on this information. So I think the biggest thing is that because this process is ongoing, it, you know, anything can happen in policy and anything can happen in an election year. But the Department of Education has stuck with its proposal to uh, eliminate the provision that allows automatic billing through three rounds of negotiated rulemaking and conversations. So it, that does indicate that they're serious about this. So I would really recommend that any institution that's currently considering a big decision to shift to inclusive access or an equitable access flat fee model, that you really delay that until the final rules are clear because you know whatever those rules end up being could impact what your vendor relationships look like and, and how that program is implemented and, and, and it could you know, ease implementation to just hold off. So definitely recommend switching existing programs to an opt-in model. And we'll hear from Wendy in just a minute about how UCF does that. You know, it's better for students and it may be required in the future. So it's uh, an action you, you can consider if, if your campus has one of these programs. And then I think just generally prioritize OER as a solution, a more sustainable way to address the actual market problem rather than just the procurement problem. <laughs> And um, to the extent that your campus is being forced in a direction of adopting a flat fee model, which I know many campuses with Barnes and Noble or Follett bookstores are, fight to protect OER and zero cost courses from that flat fee. Like don't roll back your progress, make sure the students who are choosing those courses get to benefit from the savings of those courses. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Wendy. 
Great, thank you. And uh, we're gonna switch over the slides really quick so that I can now share mine. And there we go. Hopefully you are seeing my full screen slides. So um, thank you for that detailed overview, Nicole. Um, and, and thank you for the opportunity to share UCF's story. Um, in a lot of the conversations I've had with colleagues around the country, um, not everybody knows that there is an opt-in model even available. So when you talk about inclusive access, I think most people assume you're talking about an opt-out model. So I, I really am um, pleased to be able to share our experience at, at UCF with an opt-in model. So um, based on your explanation earlier, we are a course-by-course -course, uh, model. We are not doing the flat fee. And... Um, we are a Barnes and Noble campus, and so their inclusive access program is actually called First Day. So I'll refer to it as First Day program, but um, it is our inclusive access through uh, Barnes and Noble. And so when I when I stop to think about how do I tell the UCF story, um, it's kind of in three phases. So I'll start with our initial implementation. Uh, when we first learned about um, inclusive access and started seriously looking into it for our students, uh, it was around 2018. And um, at that time, if anybody in the State University System of Florida wanted to do inclusive access, we were required to only do opt-in. That was our only option um, based on guidance from the Board of Governors. And so uh, we didn't have a choice at first. It was an opt-in or nothing. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and the main, the two main reasons why we chose to pilot the first day program was number one, um, we were really interested in the, I love that it was called first day program. We were really interested in the access that students would get starting on the first day of class. Many of our students are maybe like yours, are forced to wait until their financial aid becomes available and then they go purchase their course materials. And at, at that point, it can be, you know, as far as two weeks into the, the term. And so uh, the inclusive access program allowed them to access their digital course materials starting on the first day of class uh, for free until the opt-in window, the drop, which was tied to our ad drop window, until that window closed. And then by then they will have had to make a decision to opt into the program or go find uh, their materials elsewhere. Uh, so we started out with a pilot in spring of 2019 with just one course. I say just one course, but it was a very, very large marketing course. Um, probably one of the largest on campus. And uh, that course extensively used courseware. Uh, so that was where we started. It was a McGraw-Hill courseware uh, for marketing. And, and so we started with that. And in the first semester, now it was a large class, uh, our students saved 60, over $60,000 off of list price uh, for the courseware. And so um, based on everything running smoothly with that particular pilot, the following summer, we then piloted three courses, um, one with each of the major publishers that we were working with. So McGraw-Hill, uh, Wiley, and um, Pearson. And so, so each of those pilots went smoothly from a technology perspective. Now I'll say in my role with digital learning, uh, we were involved in helping to coordinate with the bookstore, our instructional designers, the faculty members, um, so that everything that happened through Canvas, uh, everything that happened through the LMS was moving smoothly. So from that perspective, it went really well. It was well received by the instructors, by the students. So we continue to then make it more widely available starting that following fall. So fall of 2019, we opened it up to anybody on our campus who wanted to, to participate in the program. Um, as I mentioned, it was a course by course and, and still is a course by course model. So um, our faculty members choose if they would like to participate or not. If the faculty member does not participate in the program, it's not even made available to their students in their section. Um, there are some departments who have decided across the board for consistency that everyone within the program or everyone that teaches the same course, they may all get directed to all participate. Um, but generally speaking, it's a course by course uh, decision at the faculty level to even participate in the first day program. So, um, so that has gone pretty well so far. And then a couple of years into this, uh, the, the regulations in the state of Florida were lifted that restricted us all to opt in. And so we kind of hit a 
crossroad and had the opportunity to either switch to opt out or remain opt in. Uh, so there were a lot of conversations around that. Um, I, I will even say there was a little bit of pressure to switch to opt out because it seemed like all the other all the other schools were going to opt out, right? And so it would be easier to administer um, if everybody was doing the same thing. It would be easier to administer if all students by default were opted um, were opted into the program and had to choose to opt out. Um, so there were some technical, administrative, logistical reasons for going to opt out. So we explored it. Um, and during that exploration, I will say that um, word spread and thanks to student advocacy, there was a, a student group on campus, our Wiki Knights, um, who made their voices heard and strongly advocated that we do not switch to opt out. Um, so that that gave us pause. Uh, I'm not going to lie. And so it forced us to look even more closely at that decision. And um, my vice provost of digital learning, together with the dean of, uh, at the time, the Undergraduate Studies College, they conducted a series of focus groups, uh, both with students and with faculty members, not together, separate, uh, but a set of focus groups to get both the faculty perspective and the student perspective. And overwhelmingly, in both sets of focus groups, um, we, were, we were hearing many, many reasons to stay opt-in and really only one or two reasons to stay opt out uh, or to move to opt out. And so the, the main reasons for moving to opt out were either administratively, it, it was going to be easier um, to, to administer on the back end. Um, and the only other academic focused reason for switching to opt out was we were hearing from some faculty members who required courseware in order to successfully pass their course. Um, they they wanted the default behavior to be that students uh, automatically had access and then then they would choose to opt out. Um, I did hear some of the phrasing uh, that that might be a little bit um, patronizing or um, uh, paternal uh, to kind of make that decision on the student's behalf. Uh, so it, it really wasn't a strong enough reason to switch to opt out. The stronger reason to stay opt in was that default, if student, the default setting, if students take no action, what happens? Um, in an opt in model, if a student just doesn't get the memo, doesn't understand the program, doesn't trust it, doesn't, you know, doesn't think to click that button, the default option then, if they take no action, is their student account does not get charged. Um, so, so that was a good thing. Um, and that was really the main reason why we stayed opt-in was that default behavior. If a student does nothing, they do not get charged. Um, so uh, it, it was a pretty easy decision to stay opt-in after hearing the feedback from both our students and our faculty. Um, I will say um, in the beginning, I, I may not have emphasized this, but the, the two primary reasons why we even did an opt-in inclusive access program to begin with, where number one, students have access on the first day of class. I, I started down that path earlier. Um, and so that I think was really important to us and whether it's an opt-in or an opt-out, even if they decide not to opt-in at the end of the ad drop window, students still have that free access in the first week or two of class, right up until the, the ad drop deadline. And that made a difference for a lot of students. Um, it gave them time to shop for better prices. It gave them an opportunity to um, investigate the program, see if it really makes sense to them or not. It gave them an opportunity to ask questions, to go into the bookstore, all the while having access to their digital materials. Uh, so that was the main reason for even doing the program to begin with. The, the savings, of course, is an added bonus. Um, and I'm not going to lie, we track savings, so I'll share that with you um, shortly. Uh, so the the discount that we were promised um, is is a secondary benefit that we hope will also benefit our students. Um, but mainly, it was that that initial access up front that was the most attractive part. Um, so with that said, I'll go into current state and then I'll show you some numbers. Uh, so where we are today is uh, we are still moving forward with an opt-in program. We're closely monitoring uh, the proposed legislation, feeling pretty good that if, um, if it does go through, we're well positioned already being in opt-in. 
Um, but I will tell you, our up until that legislation was even proposed, um, in many of our, our meetings with the bookstore, with the publishers, we were often reminded that we were the last remaining school that was still opt-in. Everybody else went to opt-out, right? And so there was a little bit of pressure to switch, uh, but we held strong. Um, thank goodness our, our leadership held strong. Um, we we would see more operational efficiencies if, if the legislation were to go through and everybody was opt-in, uh, because right now, there, I, I think there are two primary concerns. One is uh, the platform itself needs to be versatile for both models, opt-in and opt-out, which means there's no opportunity to really put custom language into the screen that students see inside of the LMS when it's time to press that button to opt-in or opt-out. Uh, so there's really no opportunity for us to put um, instructional language there that explains what happens if they hit the opt-in button, what happens if they do nothing. Um, so, so that has kind of made things a little bit more difficult. We need to make sure that all of those instructions and ex explanations are happening outside of that screen, uh, which happens on a course by course basis with those faculty members who have uh, decided to participate. Some are really good about making that clear to students. Uh, some maybe don't make it as, as clear as others. Um, so, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is with our transfer student population. Uh, so when we have students that transfer to UCF from another school that was opt out, when they see the screen inside of the LMS, they recognize, oh, I know what this is. Um, at my last school, I did nothing and my access continues, right? Um, and so, so a lot of our transfer students think they understand the program. And then at the end of the ad drop deadline, when their, ac their free access gets cut off, suddenly the students are left wondering, why, why can't I get in now? I don't understand. Um, and so then they have to go to the bookstore, see what they can do. And in most cases, they need to you know, pay the full price. So, um, so those are our two pain points at this, at this stage, being the sole remaining holdouts is what we're told. I know there are others out there, uh, but being the, the last remaining holdouts is an opt-in school. What I will also share before I get into some statistics is um, that I'm so glad um, that, that, that Nicole talked about um, OER and other affordability strategies because inclusive access is part of our larger affordability initiative here at UCF. And I think I even saw, I think it was Amy put in the chat earlier, she mentioned our AIM initiative, our affordable instructional materials initiative, uh, where we lead with OER. Uh, when, when talking to faculty members uh, about how to reduce the cost of their course materials for their students, we lead with OER first. And um, and also library sourced materials, wherever we can do free or, or very, very low cost, uh, that's always gonna be preferable. But at our size, uh, it's just not necessarily going to work for everybody. There may not be appropriate OER materials available yet in particular disciplines. Um, and so this is, uh, we see as a secondary opportunity to at least reduce the cost for students where we can um, and continue to be part of the larger affordability initiative. So with that said, let me give you a little bit of statistics here. So um, this current term, spring 2024, we are a large institution, so our numbers are, are big. Um, this current semester, we had 1,179 sections where the faculty member said, yes, I would like to participate in this program for my particular course section. Um, that resulted in many opt-in opportunities for students. You can see that there were actually 61,000, a little bit over 61,000 students who were um, prompted with a decision to participate or not. What that tells me is that some of our students were in more than one course that participated in first day. Um, and so our, our statistics for opting in this semester are quite consistent uh, with previous semesters over the last year or two. Uh, we kind of hover around 65% opt-in, um, which I'm told is pretty good. Um, now, the, uh, the argument for opt-out is that typically institutions may be seeing higher percentages of, of participation, but I think 65 is still pretty good. 
Um, but what we're really concerned about is that second to last bullet, the students who take no action. Um, and this kind of hovers, it's almost like a one third, two third split uh, among our students from one semester to the next, where about a third of them take no action. And it could be for different reasons. It could be they, they don't understand the program and so they're just not gonna do anything. They may not trust it. Um, in some cases, I hear parents telling their students, um, no, do what I did, go, just go to the bookstore, buy what you need to on the first day of class. Um, and so there may be some parental influence there. Uh, it may be that students uh, understand that they can go shop for a, a better price somewhere else. Uh, what, I, what I have found is um, the greatest discounts tend to occur with uh, courseware, where there really aren't too many other places uh, to get a particular piece of software, you got to go through the the publisher. Um, so, so the courseware is one place where uh, we see the most savings. If it's an e-textbook, then yeah, students often have other opportunities to either share with a, a classmate, share with a roommate, um, go find other versions online um, in, in various places, uh, or maybe even the library. Uh, oftentimes our library will try to um, stay on top of eBooks that are available and wherever they can add them to the collection, they do. So that's free um, versus going through this program. And very few of our students actually take the time to click the opt out button. Um, so, so these are kind of our general trends with student behaviors. Again, it's about a one third, two thirds split. Uh, we're about two thirds consistently opt in each semester. And so the last thing I'll share before we open it up to questions um, is our savings. Now, Nicole, I, I do respect everything you said about the savings. And so I am going to click into our site um, to show what we do track. And it came up on my other screen. So let me bring this over. Uh, what we do track is student savings and I will scroll down to our explanation. We also have a semesterly breakdown if you wanna come out here and I will put this link in the chat momentarily. Um, but what we have to go on is really comparing the opt-in price against the campus store's retail price um, if students did not participate. Um, so understanding for e-textbooks, there may be some other better places to get better pricing. Um, I, will, I will definitely advocate for that wherever I can. Uh, but again, on the courseware, sometimes our, our hands are tied where that's the only option. Um, and so these are the savings we're showing. It, it is quite significant at our scale. Uh, so since we started with that first pilot in spring of 2019, based on that calculation, we've saved our students almost $20 million. Uh, this is through fall, so we don't have spring numbers posted just yet, uh, but that will definitely take us over the $20 million mark this semester. So again, I will stop sharing in a minute and I will put this link into the chat. But when you come out to this site, if you want to follow up later, um, in addition to the savings, we do have... Um, other information out here that you may find interesting to, to learn more about how we operate within the, the first day program. Um, so we do have materials out here that explain to the students how it works. We have materials out here for faculty members to help them explain to their students how the program works. And also uh, it will link to our overall initiative where we do push OER and library source materials ahead of inclusive access, but it is part of an overall strategy for our institution. So with that, I will stop sharing and open it up to questions. I think, Kevin, you were going to help us out with that. Absolutely. So first off, thank you both. Um, some great conversation happening in the chat. Wendy, there's uh, two questions I want to queue up for you, and then I have one for Nicole. Uh, one was from the chat that was asking how many total sections were offered in spring 24. I think we were trying to get a comparison of how many sections oh. actually use first day access versus the percentage of that don't. Excellent question. Um, I, if you can give me a minute, I can look that up. If we can circle back to that question, um, sure. I, will need, I will need a minute to pull that up, but I can look that up for you. Well, in that case, uh, Tom's going to volunteer to look for that number as well. So, Wendy, I'm going to ask oh, a different great. question for you. So, you, you talked about at length how we, UCF, is the sort of the last person standing as far as an opt in. What kind of challenges has that presented for the university in fulfilling requests, considering that the, the structure, the infrastructure is built for an opt out model now? 
Yeah, I think um, I briefly touched on this earlier, but thanks for the opportunity to clarify further. I think it really comes down to um, more of an administrative and more of a communication, student communication um, are the two areas that are impacted by us being different from the rest or different from the majority in that um, the way that we administer the program on the back end uh, requires a, a lot of manual processing where at the end of the ad drop deadline, um, reports are then sent to the bookstore who forwards to our financial aid department, who are the students in each section that opted in, and then their student account gets charged. All of that has to happen in a really quick turnaround period because of financial aid disbursements. Um, if everybody was doing it the same way instead of in reverse, um, that, that might be able to offer up opportunities to automate and streamline those types of processes. Um, but then the other big one that I'm more concerned about is really student communication um, and also faculty communication. So, uh, oh, good. I see that um, the total number of sections was just reported in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, so the, the main thing, though, is student communications and instructions, making it clear to them how this works. That's the bigger issue. When you have two different models that work at uh, completely opposite, there's a lot of confusion, like I said, among transfer students but also because we're the ones that are the, the oddball out, the odd man out, we're not able to work with, um, with the publishers, with Barnes & Noble to put language into the platform that would clearly explain to students what is happening. Um, if, I, if I click the opt-in button, if I, click the, uh, if I don't click anything, what happens? Um, there aren't any opportunities to put those clear instructions in there because right now the platform needs to be broad enough to support both models. And if it really comes down to making a decision of how things are worded and how it, it, it reads in that screen inside of Canvas, they're, right now they're going to default to what serves the majority, which is the opt-out models. Uh, so I think those are the two biggest challenges, although there, there are probably others um, that I'm not even aware of. I appreciate that. And thank you for uh, Tom and Susan providing the section numbers. Just doing quick math, it looks like about 20% of our total sections were uh, first day access opt-in. Uh, Wendy, I'm going to come back to you, but Nicole, a question I have for you was the, the relationship between the publisher and the bookstore. And who is the current driver behind inclusive access and where should for attendees be focusing their attention for conversations with leadership? That's a really interesting question because originally inclusive access was being pushed very much by the, the textbook publishing industry. But increasingly we've we've been hearing from campuses that the push to move the move to this model and, and, and particularly the push to move to the, the flat fee model is being driven by bookstores and specifically the uh, large bookstore corporations to which many institutions outsource their operations, Barnes and Noble and Follett. Um, Barnes and Noble in particular has been very uh, transparent in, it, in its communications with investors that the first day complete flat fee model is the future of its business and that it is going to be pushing most campuses to move in that direction. So if you're on a, on a Barnes and Noble campus, and haven't heard about this happening at your campus yet, chances are it's just that you haven't heard about the conversation. Um, it's probably happening. So, you know, these I hear all of the time from libraries, which I work with most closely, but other people on campus who are involved in affordability, campus uh, textbook affordability initiatives, that they are not consulted when major decisions are made about textbook sales models. And I think there can sometimes be an assumption that, and oh, and I also hear this from provosts and faculty as well. And I think there can be sometimes an assumption that, you know, bookstore operations and procurement decisions are, are, are really business decisions and, and separate from the academic side of the house and, and, you know, not important to consult with through shared governance and let alone with students. But the reality is that it does matter and how textbooks are billed to students. And when certainly when you when you change things or, or, or take away the ability of students to manage their finances in a way that they have typically had, it, it is very important 
to consult that with students and faculty because it, it does have a material impact. In terms of advice, uh, man, I, I, uh, it, it really depends on your campus. But to the extent that you know you can speak with with your administration, you know, share some materials. Inclusiveaccess.org is a great website to to get um, information that you can share about sort of the other side of the story about inclusive access, because typically what they're hearing is from vendors and not from the the academic side. So that I guess that that would be my my best my best advice. Use your network. Try to try to reach people who who are having those conversations. Thank you. I, I'm going to note there's one question and that uh, another question in the chat that may stem to yesterday's conversation where Jonathan Lashley during his keynote was talking about sort of the dynamic between the markup in relation to the uh, percentage of sales that goes to the institution from from um, bookstore purchases. And I see Nicole already has responded about uh, the Spark website having some information, but Wendy, I'm not sure if you're able to respond about the money the institution may receive from first day purchases. I believe there's a sort of a standard agreement in any Barnes and Noble's contract. You know what? I apologize. I do not have that information, but we can certainly look that up and and follow up. I I have not had the privilege of reviewing our contract, <laughs> but I know others here have. No worries. I'm, I'm going to read a next question here is, can you share the process of faculty buy-in and how faculty are supported if and when they choose to participate? Oh, I can feel that one. <laughs> um, so in the beginning, uh, right after our successful pilots, uh, we did do a lot more marketing uh, than we do today in that we we had a big open house in our student union and invited all of our faculty members to come. We invited the bookstore and the publishers to participate. Um, and I believe we did this twice uh, where the, the publishers were available. Um, so we, we asked um, together with Barnes and Noble to present, this is the program, this is how it works. And then afterwards they could go to separate rooms and talk to their particular publishers about how that would work. Um, after that initial awareness campaign, we have not repeated that since then. Uh, instead, we focused more on ongoing email campaigns uh, that are tied to the textbook adoption uh, calendar for each semester. Um, and so we send out uh, inf informational emails with instructions where um, our unit, the Center for Distributed Learning, will work directly with faculty members who are new to the program or who are concerned about technical issues inside of their Canvas courses. Uh, we have a whole instructional design team that will work with them, and our technical support team will help with any issues with linking or access. Uh, but otherwise, the program is administered through the bookstore. So when it comes to making their final selection, or I, I don't know how much they can individually negotiate pricing, uh, but any concerns about pricing goes straight to the bookstore. Um, I will say uh, that our bookstore manager on campus really has been a, a great partner. So when, when faculty members come to them with issues in the LMS or vice versa, they've worked very closely with us. They've also been supportive of our OER programs um, and our library source material offerings, trying really hard. I think where we hit some challenges is with the corporate office, but our, our bookstore managers have been a good partner in offering support to our faculty members. Thank you. Noting that we're a little over time, we've got one last question that I'm going to ask Wendy and Nicole to respond to as to the best of their ability. But it, it's a it starts off, I think the nature of the question is that there tends to be an ongoing question about the quality of OER materials, or at least the the, the number of, of materials available, but yet there isn't the same level of scrutiny for the materials that are included with an inclusive access model, either the quality or the, the number of materials that are available. How do we combat that conversation? You want to go first, Nicole? Um, sure. I mean, it's I, I think no matter where you sit within the institution, there is something you can do to raise awareness of open educational resource. I think for individual faculty, it's talking to your peers. 
um, sharing your own experience for, for librarians, it's offering your expertise to somebody who can go out and search for materials. I do think, you know, as with all things, it, there's sometimes a bit of culture change and shift in, in age old perceptions of things like, you know, adages that no longer apply, like you get, you get what you pay for. <laughs> And um, so I, I think the uh, word of mouth is, is really uh, helpful in that and in, in just sharing, sharing stories. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add, you know, it, it is a cultural shift. And, you know, at least on our campus, um, our larger affordability initiative, we bring together all of the various faculty support services. So um, digital learning, the library, our faculty center for teaching and learning, undergraduate studies that does all the um, compliance reporting. We all come together to try to collectively align our efforts um, to spread the word to faculty and provide resources. Um, there are a lot of great OER materials out there, and we have pockets around campus um, that I could name, um, Integrated Business, Physics, who have all successfully at the program level instituted um, various OER initiatives where they are close to or um, almost at uh, zero textbook cost for the whole program. And oh my goodness, I, in my notes, I totally forgot um, that I will also promote that as part of our overall initiative, we do recognize our faculty members uh, who have low or zero textbook cost courses. Um, so through the state of Florida, FIU started Affordability Counts. I can throw that link in the chat as well in just a second. Um, but it's it's a curated um, website where any faculty member in, in any of the institutions across the state university system, if they have um, manage to get the total cost of their course materials below $20 per credit hour or less, ideally zero, um, but under that threshold, they can actually report into this database what their materials are that made it a low cost course. They get a medallion that they can place inside their online course, so it shows up in Canvas, but then also it curates a whole database of vetted materials that others are using that they're pleased with that you can go in and just keyword search by discipline or by course number. Um, oh, thank you, Rocco. Rocco put it in there for you. So um, that's a great place to also see where your colleagues are are finding low or zero cost materials. Let me just take this opportunity to thank both of you for this wonderful session. Um, if folks could give a virtual round of applause to Nicola and to Wendy. Um, we'll make this recording available. We'll also provide the slides at a future date. But a quick reminder before you disconnect that we do have a 1 p.m. open pedagogy session that is a drop-in, so come with your questions. And we do have a 4 p.m. student panel uh, uh, set up where we do have some of the folks that uh, Nick, Wendy had mentioned around the Wiki Nights uh, who had advocated to stay an opt-in model. But with that, um, I do hope you stay till 1 p.m. and you come back at 4, but thank you all for joining.